to remember if you're going to play in this game is do not ever, 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 if you can help it, never panic. I mean, what you got to do is to play it close to the best. And not only that, you got to keep your head around. You just got to keep your head. You got to realize that he who panics, he who begins to feel the water in the knees, is the first one who goes down when that great last comes rolling up over that long, long field just outside the town. Now, of course, the, the problem is one which all of us, it's like the letter I got from this indignant 14-year-old kid. He says, Shepherd, if it's all so rotten, what's your plan? Well, <laughs> presented there with obviously a choice. Which, incidentally, man has always liked as long as it remains in the abstraction. Like last night, I'm watching this ancient movie. It's a movie about men who are trying to break out of a prison camp during World War II. And uh, they're, they're using all kinds of, of subterfuges. They have all sorts of little games and tricks. It's a beautifully done movie and a very exciting one. For those of you who stayed up to 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning to watch... Uh, I, I, I'm a kind of an addict of the late, late, late movies. This is the tail end of it all. These are, the, these are the ones that they never say before they show them. This is a New York premiere. Nothing. It's been on for years. Late, late movie. I'm also a fan of the late, late, late uh, reverends who come on and bless the television station and all the listening audience and the viewing audience before the flag flies and the NARTB code sign comes up. Somehow... This is a proper end of a of a 20th century American's day. To have a, a transcribed minister say something over us on film. And uh, to see those... Have, have you ever wondered about this? The, 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 the star-spangled banner comes on and they're singing about the land of the, the land of the free and the home of the brave and peace. And all you see on the screen are jet planes flying back and forth and guys marching and bombs going off. Somehow... <laughs> Somehow I feel a little, a little uncomfortable about that when they're doing it, and and uh, it usually just follows a five-minute newscast where somebody has made threatening gestures in our direction, and then the jet planes fly past, and more soldiers fly, and the flag flies, and then I feel better. Uh, oh, uh, oh yes, and just just before the NARTB sign comes on, the man uh, who is always off camera assures us that. One more day in magnificent May is just about to come up, or, or another day in fantastic January is about to be unfolded before us the next day. So it's always the sense of waiting. Now, to that I rate 14 year older. I, 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 I don't know. I have been trying to think of an alternate plan. I have considered Tahiti, and I've, I've realized there, of course, there's no, there's no dough there, and my agent wouldn't follow me there. I'm perfectly aware of that. Uh, on the other hand, on the other hand, son, I say that, that as far as plans go, it has been my experience, and I might say that I'm one of the most inexperienced of all human beings. And, uh, of course, uh, all human beings are inexperienced when it comes to, uh, let's say, the ultimate sense of experience. After all, I mean, we are only on one small corner of that gigantic that gigantic battlefield. I remember one time I, I saw... A, how long has it been since you've seen a panoramic painting? Well, a panoramic painting, in case any of you are interested, is, a, is, a, is an early version of... Well, it was before they had movies, and people still wanted to see everything happening at once. 
They wanted to have a sense of development. They wanted to have a sense of, of drama. And they wanted to have a sense of, of, of marching of time and events past a given point. This is what a movie is, actually, see? In the 19th century, the panoramic painting grew to be one of the big art forms. It was a tremendous thing. In fact, uh, the, the panoramic painting that I saw had been resurrected from somebody's barn. It had been the central showpiece of a, of a country fair for many, many years. And it was now resurrected, and it was a panorama of the Civil War. Now, now, son, I want you to listen to this. And it bears very closely on what we're talking about. It was a panoramic view of the Civil War. It was over a block long. And it was in Indiana where they have long blocks. As a matter of fact, it stretched from Kokomo all the way to Terre Haute which was a block out there. And this was a panoramic painting of the Civil War. Now, what the artist tried to do was to paint every soldier who had fought on the north and every soldier who had fought on the south. Now, at one time, there were over three million people under arms wearing the blue and something like three and a half million people wearing gray. So he had a, he had a job cut out for him. And he accomplished it. He certainly did. And not only that, he drew all the battles on one canvas, not just a few of the battles, but all the battles of the Civil War, all the skirmishes, the peace treaties. He even, he even touched a little bit on the, on the antebellum period and on the postbellum period, over there near the right edge of the canvas and near the left edge of the canvas. Now, you see, what he was trying to do was to encompass it all. And... Now, I can remember walking along that for miles, it seemed like, looking at all those guys who'd fought that Civil War. And I remember my Aunt Gwen saying next to me, looking up, I think it was right near the Battle of Bull Run. She was looking up at the Battle of Bull Run, which was which actually was painted in particularly garish paint because he was in the middle of his mold period. You see, it took this painter over 20 years to paint this. He went through several periods. He went through a mauve period. He went through a fall bay period. He went through a period of, of complete representationalism. And then he got tired for a while and sagged in the middle. And then he went uphill all the way on up until he finally wound up in his pre-cubistic period with a big crash of symbols. It was a wonderful painting. And so I'm standing there next to my Aunt Glenn. My Aunt Glenn looks up there at that whole thing. She's standing by the Battle of Bull Run, and she says, You know, sometimes I wonder... Where it's all going to end. I says, Aunt Glenn, it's going to end over there near Kokomo. I know. And she says, no, that isn't what I mean, son. I wonder where it's all going to end. I says, well, Aunt, Aunt Glenn, you can see the end down there where those people are gathering, eating the cotton candy down there. That's where the end is. Says, no, that's not what I mean. I wonder where it's all going to end. Well, that reminded me, of course, one thing leads into the next. If you'll notice... I'm using my Indiana accent today. After having listened to uh, Galen Drake do the Indiana program, which I enjoyed immensely, I'm once again under the influence of that great herd of cow herders and gum chewers which have come out of the Wabash Valley so many, many years ago. Well, that reminded me, too, of a scene which I don't know, I, I don't think, well, I might as well admit it, it just appeared once in my mind be perfectly honest with you. And, and, of course, Saturday is a kind of day for these things to appear in your mind. Saturday has a gothic quality about it. I, I suppose some of you are aware of the derivation of the word Saturday, which refers to Saturn, which refers to Saturnalia, which uh, refers to some things that happen occasionally on Saturday nights in Darien, Connecticut. Who <laughs> not going to that. <laughs> George, maybe we ought to. <laughs> you know, it's, isn't it funny how, how we, we, all the time, I mean, we're involved in all this jazz, this business of, of communicating and so on. I, I was on a, on a panel show the other day, a couple of weeks ago, on television, one of these big coast-to-coast -coast type shows that, that uh, somehow dot the networks during the summer more than they do in the wintertime. Uh, they, they, they come on, and, and they're always important type people who are discussing fantastically cosmic issues. Our panel today will now discuss the end of all mankind. They will take it from all aspects in 30 minutes. And now here is the Admiral.
and the Admiral tells a little bit of his experience at the end of Mankind and so on. And I was on a panel where we were discussing, of all things, the, the lack of communication between generations. And I, I was sitting there waiting for the thing to begin, and these, these are always very painful. I don't know whether you know much about uh, the, the panel proposition. They're very painful before they get underway. It's, 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 as, though, it's as though debate has become showbiz. Uh, we, we'd like to have a little disagreement among you folks there. Fellas, let's speed it up there just before the first commercial. Got to have a little disagreement here and a little controversy. We've got to throw in there near the last. And you're, you're, you're sitting there, and everybody is... Is, is kind of tense, and then the, the show begins, and you're discussing a question which seems to be as remote, as, as completely remote, from what you're doing and from what you're feeling and what you're sensing as possibly a game of badminton could be. And you're just sitting there, and the, the question is going on, and nobody's really answering it, and everybody's playing his part. And it was my turn to say something, and it suddenly occurred to me, just, just, what a, what a ludicrous situation this was. On a Sunday morning, discussing the lack of communication between generations. And uh, I couldn't figure out, first of all, what a generation was. I've been thinking, I've been, I've been conscientiously trying to think of what is a generation, you know. Uh, where, where does the demarcation line start and stop? Now, you can give me all the classical definitions. A, a generation is 21 years. Yeah, but there's a new crowd that starts every 30 seconds. Uh, where where do you stop, you know? And, and what generation am I part of? I don't know. I have absolutely no idea that, that a lot of guys around here who are supposed to be of my generation, I am totally out of touch with at the station. I have met nine-year-old kids whom I communicate with completely, thoroughly. Uh, I have met 75-year-old women who immediately we, we, we can establish a, a rapport. I, I have met guys, it's, it's as though, you know, the funny thing about this generation business, you hear a lot of talk about the beat generation, and most people seem to think that the beat generation, uh, according to the classical definition, is a crowd of guys about 19 or 20 years old. Well, there is much evidence to the contrary. Uh, for example, how many of you know how old Jack Kerouac is? I mean, Kerouac is generally considered to be the, uh, the the spokesman of the B generation and so on. Of course, a lot of them now will object to that. But the fact is that he is generally considered to be that. And Kerouac uh, is, is well up in his late 30s, as far as I know. In fact, I know he is. And, and, and yet, I, it's, it's a very common thing. I've seen it time and time again, where some guy will be driving along, he's, he's 35 years old, and he says, ah, these, ah, Kerouac, a bunch of crummy, bunch of beat generation crowd. And he's talking about his own generation. Uh, apparently, he thinks he's talking about somebody who's 18 years old. And it goes back and forth. So there is no real, I think there is no genuinely classical, I'll do it, Russ. There's no, yeah, uh, this is, uh, speaking of uh, beat generations, this is WOR AM at FM New York. And uh, we'll be here until till uh, two o'clock. Uh, I don't know uh, what what uh, the beat generation is supposed to be. I have no idea what the gen. Now, when I'm saying generation, I'm saying age differentiation. I'll, I want to show you something here. Now, listen carefully. I read a I read a letter to you from a kid. Give you an idea. This the, the, what what made me think of all this is that I'm listening to Galen Drake this morning, and Drake is talking about Indiana. Well, I know something about Indiana. I came from Indiana. I, I lived in Chicago and Indiana. I uh, was born in Chicago, lived there for a long time, then then spent most of my formative years in Indiana and then moved back to Chicago. So I know something about Indiana, and it's interesting that the Indiana that comes out generally is a bucolic sort of Indiana, is an Indiana of, of new-mown hay, it's an Indiana of the long... Cur and by the way, I have seen the Wabash. I heard Galen say that he didn't, he didn't remember how the... Well, I'll tell you how the Wabash looks. I used to fish in the Wabash quite often. Uh, the Wabash River, which... Uh, the, the Wabash that I fished in. Of course, a river, a Midwestern river, is a very special thing. It is not like uh, the Eastern rivers. You cannot parallel a Midwestern river with the Hudson, nor with the East River, or any of the rivers that you know in the eastern half of the United States. The, the Midwestern rivers 
are really, in many ways, much more of a way of life than the river that I have known here in the east. Uh, that much of the whole area around the river is built on the river. I've lived on the Ohio. I've lived on the Little Miami River, which is an interesting river out in the Midwest. And I've lived also near the Wabash. And another, a, a very colorful river in Indiana is the Kankakee. You ever heard of the Kankakee? Well, these these rivers, uh, well, they're all Indian names. Actually, the Little Miami, the Kankakee, the Calumet, another Indian name. Uh, the, the rivers of Indiana are slow-moving, flat, coffee-colored streams. Uh, they, they are colored. Uh, it would be as if you took coffee and you put about a half a teaspoon of milk in the coffee. You got this, this almost, almost uh, cream-colored coffee, but not quite. It's browner than that. And the, the willows and the sycamores and so on hang deep over the water. And generally speaking... Are, are growing, many of them grow right in the water at certain periods of the year. But it's interesting, I have seen the disappearance of a river in my time. Uh, a river that completely disappeared from the earth. <laughs> this, is a, this is a frightening experience, but flowing about a mile from my home when I was a boy was a river called the Little Calumet. Uh, Calumet is, uh, is the name... You, are you familiar with calumet baking powder? Do you know about this? Well, calumet baking powder is made in that area, and calumet is the name of an Indian tribe that lived in that area, the calumet Indians, and the word calumet itself means peace. Uh, the, For example, Illinois. Illinois is another name of a tribe. The, the Illinois or the Illini, uh, that particular name means little onion. But this, this is all beside the point. Uh, the, the Indians that lived in that neighborhood had named this, this river the Little Calumet. Of course, it had gotten Americanized or Anglicized since. But this slow-moving river that moved to the lake, the lake in this case being Lake Michigan, uh, this slow-moving river moved through the farms. And, and one whole summer, I worked for a surveyor. And it was one of the most horrendous jobs that I've ever had in my life as far as working physically is concerned. I was in high school, and the surveyor uh, came to high school looking for a couple of kids to work for him, and I got the job. And this was in the days when getting any kind of a job was a, was a tremendous thing. And I got a job working all summer for a surveyor. And this, this surveyor was working on a project where he was uh, laying out the lines that were to mark the edge of dredging operations for the widening of the Little Calumet River. And it was a tremendous operation, this, 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 this job that we undertook. And it began in June, just about this time of the year, and it was hot. Oh, it was so hot. It was steaming hot down there in the river flatlands. And I might say this, that the rivers in Indiana are all surrounded by marshy country. They are not clearly marked off rivers the way you have here in the east, where you have the rock Mound rivers and that's it. There's a shore and the river flows. There are all sorts of marshy lands, and you go through swamps and so on. The rivers are very indefinite, and they, they overflow their banks all the time, too, at different times of the year. And so we began to work our way uh, toward the lake from the county line, the county in this case being Lake County, Indiana. And it was a, it was a sense of about maybe... 40 miles, something like that, total, that is total distance with the meanders included in the river. And we were working along at 25 and 30 yard intervals, staking out the river and working through swamps and working through uh, cornfields and working through these most, the most desperate parts of Indiana. And I remember, I remember this tremendous heat pressing down on me. And millions and millions and millions, oh, an incalculable number of mosquitoes. The mosquitoes in the Andi Indiana bottomland are indescribable. And working through this, and I'm, I'm a cool 15 years old, and like a 15-year-old, I, I don't want to do this after about three days. This is, this is not for me, but I couldn't get out of it. Have you ever had something, a job or something like a, a, a task done? Have you ever had something that you just could not duck out of? that it would have been impossible for you to duck out of, and you just had to do it, and you get this fantastic boredom. You're so bored that your head is bulging out like a balloon, 
and and you you just sort of walk in a daze, and every time anybody gives you a chance for the slightest break, uh, a lunch break or or a break to have a a, a bottle of a bottle of coke or something, is is a you just look forward to every minute to this break. Well, this summer dragged on, and I I began to be bored by about the middle of June. And by about the middle of July, my head was numb from the top of my, all the way down to my ankles with boredom. I was bored where for one complete summer and covered, thoroughly covered from head to foot with mosquito bites. And I remember slogging through the swamp and chopping away for the chain man. Do you know what a chain man is in, uh, in surveying terms? Well, my job was forward chain man and pin man with the surveyor. And I would go ahead with the chain. The chain is that long steel tape, that long steel ruler that surveyors use. You know, when, when you when you learn something about surveying just a little bit, you realize what real labor is. Do you know that it, it is well, it, it it is a that somebody has measured America from one end to the other inch by inch with a steel measuring tape. Are you aware of that? That every yard of this country has been measured with steel tapes and with little pins, and and this immense amount of labor, which seems to be such a lost labor, and that a great big arching sky and that fantastic pressure of heat, and this is what I remember much of of, of Indiana, uh, the uh, the rivers, of course, of Indiana. But then then on the other hand, uh, this business of of communicating. I'm listening to Drake, and I'm I'm saying. Uh, what about what about the other part of Indiana, the, the side of Indiana that hardly anybody knows that Norman Rockwell ever paints? Uh, Indiana also is a is a state of tremendous slums. Are you aware that that there are more slums in Indiana than in uh, many many of the states which you generally consider to be real slum states? For example, there are several cities I know of that are composed almost entirely of slums. Uh, for example, Gary, Indiana is practically all slums. All slums. I mean real slums. I mean the kind of slums where you have the all-night chili parlors and the fist fights. Are you aware that, that, the, that there is a town called Indiana Harbor, Indiana, that is as tough a city as you'll find this side of the Barbary Coast? That is a fact. This is a city where it is worth your life to go into at, at 3 o'clock in the morning because, you know, any minute now it will happen. Have you ever heard of Calumet City, Illinois, which is right across the border from Indiana, uh, right across from Hammond, Indiana? Calumet City is a city so wild. It is, it is a city so completely devoid of any sort of morality at all that even when, well, in, in the broad daylight, you can stand two miles away from Calumet City and you see a red glow in the air. I'm telling you the truth. There is a red glow of neon night and day. Many of the denizens of Calumet City have not seen daylight for maybe 30 years. And uh, Calumet City, of course, is which in, in many of the same areas is, is like a waterfront town. You know what a waterfront, the difference between a waterfront city and a, and a non-waterfront city is that you have a, a population of transients laboring class. This is the, the seamen. Who comes in? He comes in for three days. He's got money to spend. He spends it, and boy, he spends it the way he wants to spend. There's always somebody there to take it. Believe me, they they gather like flies at a hog killing, to use an old Indiana term. There will always be those who are there to 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 shuck the honest toiler of his honest gains, and they will do it in any in any fashion, any manner that he wants them to do it. You see, and so. <laughs> And, and there are always those, don't think. And this is this is what makes a seaport town what it is. Marseille is a seaport. Have you ever been to Marseille? Well, you know what I'm talking about. Any real seaport town has that has that international no no border area, no no holes barred, no nationality quality about it. Well, there are inland seaport towns. I don't know whether anybody's ever reported on this. If they haven't, I'm reporting on it right now. There are such things as inland seaport towns that have nothing to do with water uh, because they are based on exactly the same premises that the seaport world is based on. Now, that is to say, the honest toiler who is there to be shucked and who has no no scruples no more, and, and is completely ready for anything that will happen and like flies at a hog kill them, they gather. And such a town is a town named Calumet City. 
Indiana, or it's actually Illinois, but it, it lays right on the border. In fact, there's a, there's a street named State Line Street, and one half of the street is Illinois and the other half is Indiana, and State Line Street runs right down the middle of Calumet City. Well, now, the reason that these things uh, build themselves up is usually because of legal situations. And Indiana is partially a dry state. Uh, Indiana is a state that has, has very tightly controlled liquor laws, and they, the taverns close at midnight, and there are only, uh, there's a certain amount of taverns per population. They are, they are controlled as far as the kind of entertainment they can have and so forth. And so what happens, you see, when you have a tremendous population of real tough guys, which is exactly what you have in the steel mills. You have all the great steel mills curving around that, that long bend of the lake, uh, that long bend of Lake Michigan that hangs right down on the northern end of Indiana. If you take a look at a map, and you'll find Lake Michigan just skims along the northern edge. In fact, the northern border of Indiana is the lake shore. And Indiana swings on up just a little bit and touches the, the, uh, the very touch, the very edge of Chicago. And right in that area, you have this tremendous, uh, what is the equivalent, the inland equivalent of a seaborne population. And that is the swing shift laborer who works in the steel mill. Now, many of these guys are transients. And you have thousands of them. As a matter of fact, when, when you see the mill letting out at, uh, at midnight, uh, there are something like 20,000 men come out of one mill. There's a tremendous population of people, you realize. And these guys have all got money, and they don't want to go home. And many of them don't have any home. Most of them live in the railroad YMCA, and they are ready to swing. But everything has closed in India. And there, a half a mile away, is the state line. And there at the state line has gathered this little humble group of Arabs who are willing to trade. And you can see the neon glow over there. And like, like a great horde of locusts, they descend in that city. And at, and at maybe 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, the streets, they, they don't even have traffic moving through most of the streets in Calumet City. You just walk along in the middle of the street, millions of guys, all of them wearing overalls and some of them carrying lunch buckets and, and, and going from one joint to the next. And this is, this is a part of Indiana you never hear talked about. But uh, this, is, this is a kind of an inland seaport town. And there are others. I can tell you about, about some of the inland seaport towns in northern Kentucky. I don't know whether you've spent a Saturday night in Covington, Kentucky, ever. But unless you have, you don't really know what America is about. Uh, many people here in the East don't really understand America. Uh, many, uh, many people, of course, in the Midwest don't understand America either because they've never moved. But to anyone who has moved back and forth across this country, you realize that there is something wild in the country. Uh, there is something wild in the country, and the native of Central America is, is as inexplicable to the Easterner as, say, a native of the Bulgar flatlands is to a native of Paris. Uh, they're, they're just, uh, you might speak some of the same language but none of the same prejudices and none of the same worries and fears. Did you ever see a snake chucking? Well, I remember one time in, in northern Kentucky, I'll tell you about a snake chucking. This is a religious, a religious group in Kentucky and in Tennessee who gather illegally, by the way, occasionally on a Sunday afternoon to allow rattlesnakes to bite them, to prove their piety in the eye of God. And I can remember coming over a hill one day, driving my car, and somebody, there's a great crowd of people gathered off in a field under a grove of trees in Kentucky. And there's a little, a little sign that had been stuck on the edge of the road there, just a piece of wood with a, with a white piece of paper, and it says, snake chucking today. A snake chucking today. So I pull up my car, and I walk over the cornfields and into the grove of, of woods, and there they were, whooping and hollering. Rolling around on had four big rattlesnakes that they had taken out of baskets. And the faithful were stepping up and allowing them to bite them on the wrists. And this rising cry, and then suddenly someone says, Shh, the sheriff's coming. And they broke like, they broke like, uh, like a crowd of mosquitoes at the, at the sound of the sight of a flit gun. And they scattered into the woods and hiding in the bushes. And the sheriff drove up and, and, and he caught a couple of natives wearing, wearing these blue overhauls. Now, I'm standing right there, obviously, an outlander. He said, here, there's a snake chucking going on here. And, well, what do you mean, Sheriff? No snake chucking here. We've just been having a reunion. It's a reunion? Yes, we've been having a reunion. Reunion of the Johnson family. 
And, of course, you can find millions of Johnsons all over Kentucky. Anytime you're going to have a reunion or a crap game, you say it's a reunion of the Johnson family. Having a Johnson, he says, okay, I thought, just thought there was a little trouble going on here. And he got back in his Ford V8 and drove on down the road in the snake chuck and continued. <laughs> well, now, what I'm merely referring to here is is the great heartland of America. And this is this is the America that is alive now. This is not a hundred years ago. As a matter of fact, this happened in 1951. Uh, this, this is, this is, this is the, this is the land. This is the country. This is the great seething mass that we're all part of. Now, we're hanging on the edge of the Bronx and on Staten Island. We have our own mores here. Uh, I think, uh, in many ways, New York is a kind of country within a country. As is the case, incidentally, with most, uh, with most seaport towns. I, I was particu- have been particularly fascinated with something that A.J. Liebling, who I think is one of the great reporters of America, has been doing recently in The New Yorker. Uh, I, I don't often find things which excite me these days in The New Yorker, but the last couple of weeks, A.J. Liebling, he writes, he writes, I'll tell you why I like Liebling. First of all, Liebling has obviously a great interest in all the activities of mankind. Uh, something that bothers me is to, is to find a man who, who will, will walk away from things which are going on because he doesn't like them. Oh, this is, this is wrong. You should, you should stand and look. You should watch this great crowd at the ball game. You should hear this guy hollering, Come on, baby, hang in there. This is all part of it, you know. You, you should go to the snake chunkin' and, and uh, just, just stand off and look. And if you do stand off and look enough, you begin to have this great love of it all, which is, is an undeniable thing. Nelson Algren made a remark which I think should be reported at this, at this juncture. Algren was talking about love, uh, the love for people and the love for the land. And he said that he has noticed that, uh, that the more people knock around and the more difficulties they have been in, the more, uh, the way he put it, the more knocks on the side of the head they have gotten, and probably the more afternoons they have spent working in the open hearth and the steel mill, the more respect they have for mankind and the more love they have for the, for the whole panoply of it all. And he, he, he went on to say that the people who somehow slip into it easily, who, who uh, go to the good Eastern school, who, who immediately have the good agent, who immediately slip into a nice job at life, they begin to be cynical. They begin to have, have the, 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 the ability to talk out of the side of the mouth and become very, uh, yes, I've seen this myself. Of course, it is not a generality. It shouldn't be taken that, but I have seen it. A uh, very interesting thing about, about living in this country, I, very few of us really know anything about anybody has ever tried to encompass all of it. Our national literature which uh, has fascinated me for a long time, rarely even touches on the life that is really lived by people. You don't think for a minute that J.D. Salinger really writes about the life that is lived by many, many people. Uh, Thomas Wolfe tried. Uh, some people have, have tried to deal with it. Mark Twain never did. Mark Twain was more of a fabulist than anything else. Uh, but but the stories the stories of the Calumet cities of the world, of of the Indiana world, the the stories of the Covington Kentucky. I remember one night. I'll tell you a little incident that happened that that might give you some insight into into what kind of a world we're living in. I happened to be living on Madison Avenue in Covington, Kentucky. <laughs> Madison Avenue in Covington, Kentucky. Somehow the irony of it all. And and uh, I was living. I was living above a jewelry store in an apartment that was built directly over the steam, uh, over the over the steam, uh, the boiler, the pressure boiler that built up steam for this building. And I can remember night after night after night in the middle of summer, my floor was so hot I couldn't put my feet on it. And I could just feel this whole building seething with great heat. And down in the courtyard, a, a Kentucky. A Kentucky cab driver would return from work at about 4 o'clock every morning. You see, I worked late. I had a radio show, but I used to wind up about 2 o'clock in the morning. It was then I began to know something about the night world of, 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 the, whole, of the whole panoply of it all. And, you know, incidentally, it, it has bothered me so much what has happened to the term night people, which uh, I, I have always regretted coining. Uh, this is a term which I coined, and I will stand 
accused and guilty of it. And I notice that people have taken it up and abused it to cover all sorts of sins of omission and commission. It has nothing to do with Walter Winchell's world of busboys, nothing to do with Walter Winchell's world and Damon Runyon's world of cab drivers. This is not the night people that I'm referring to. I'm talking about with that wild tossing in the soul that somehow makes them stay up to 3 o'clock in the morning and brood. They might get up at 7 the next morning and go to work, but that ain't what their that isn't what their life is about. Not a bit of it. Uh, and I began to know something about this world and began to be part of it. And as a matter of fact, always have been philosophically until finally I became not only philosophically but every other uh, way involved in it. And so, to me, generally, the world is not what it is until it's three or two or one o'clock in the morning. It begins to have a sharp focus to it. It has nothing to do with metabolic rates either. Uh, <laughs> This is another story, too. I, I remember reading a, a couple of weeks ago, some, some clown out on the West Coast is writing about the beats, and he says he didn't want to use the term night people. And so he says, we are the nocturnal people. <laughs> Probably felt that he was coining an original phrase. But that's neither here nor there. The, uh, Nelson Ogren is probably as close a, uh, a blood brother as far as philosophical outlook on on the uh, on the world that he knows, as anybody I know in literature, when I say blood brother, I mean to me. Uh, if there is anyone whom I vibrate to, it's probably Algren, and I'm sure that Algren vibrates to my stuff too, which is neither here nor there. But I remember, I remember uh, a thing that Liebling did. That it's it's in the current New Yorker. If you want to get a little insight into some of the our, our time, Liebling is doing. A, a piece, I don't know whether it's a two- or three-part article, on Louisiana politics and the state of Louisiana itself. And he makes the point that New Orleans is part of the Hellenistic world. I don't know whether many people are aware that, that our country, uh, like every other part of the world, falls into spheres of cultural influence that lie outside of the borders of the United States. And New Orleans is one of the great areas that does. Uh, it's part of the Hellenistic world, and he makes a beautiful picture of Louisiana. But I remember one time I'm living in Covington, and this is uh, sort of a, a postscript to this thing. I don't know why I'm doing a show like this. I hope I'm not boring you this morning. But I was listening to Galen Drake talk about Indiana, and there is so much to be said about our country, and there is so little said. And when it is said, it generally is said in the the unreal terms of the sentimentalist, uh, the unreal, the sad terms of somebody who hasn't really looked at what it's about, uh, and, but nevertheless plays upon a valentine to something that never was. One of the beautiful things that, that A.J. Liebling points out, we have the, the, the national, it's a kind of superstition that before Civil War days, the South was this beautiful place and wonderful people lived in it. And, and all these towns were lovely, and there was a great sense of peace, and, and the, the banjo is playing on the veranda at dusk. And he writes a piece on how the South really was before the Civil War. It was nothing at all like that. Nothing. We have a tendency to romanticize, not only romanticize, but even worse, sentimentalize. And I can't sentimentalize about Indiana. I can say this about Indiana. It is a unique state, but then every other state is too. Uh, it, it is really unique, though, if, of course, there's no such thing as being really more or less unique. But Indiana, in my experience, has such a wide diversity of culture that from this type of culture has sprung the great humorists of our world, the, the songwriters of our world. And the reason for this is because they are constantly confronted with that split right down the middle of mankind, that, that great split, that, 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 the, the, the urban man and the bucolic man. They are split between the frontier and civilization. And even to this day, Indiana is part frontier and part civilization. But I remember one night uh, looking out of my apartment in Covington, Kentucky, uh, at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm looking out, and there's a, there's a parking lot across the way next to a white castle where the hamburgers, and everybody in this white castle, by the way, were, were from southern Kentucky, and they came from a, 
a, a fabled county. There is a fabled county down in southern Kentucky where where a, a law-abiding man is considered a real freak and where anyone who represents the law is, uh, well, he's expendable. Not only is he, he can't get any sort of insurance at all. And these, these uh, Kentuckians would come up and they would, they would man all the all-night diners and all the all-night juke joints. And they work in them. They work the hot plate. And so night after night, I had adopted a kind of, uh, of a Kentucky accent because you have to have a Kentucky accent or else they just, they just don't cotton to you. Uh, they, they just don't cotton to you and, and they don't talk to you. So you sit down there at the end of the counter and you'll say, I'll have two dogs, please. Two dogs. And the man behind the counter say, how do you want them? You want them with mustard or do you want them plain? And then you say, I'll have them with mustard. And then you sit there for a minute and you you have to do this. It's part of the social ritual. You put a nickel in the jukebox. And you put on a, a well, generally a Hank Snow record. Or, or a, let's say you put on a Roy Acuff record. And Roy comes on singing about the Red River Valley. I'm lonesome for my home in the Red River Valley. And you, you throw that you throw that nickel in, you sit there and you eat your dog, and then another guy wanders in, a tall, thin guy. And he's from Corbin, Kentucky. He sits down back at the counter and he says, Hi, Luke. And Luke says, Heidi, Frank, you want the regular? Frank says, Yep, I want uh, how you got any hot vegetable soup tonight? And he says, Yep. And the world just sort of flows on. It's that kind of world. And about every 20 minutes or so, some guy comes in from one of the local taverns. The, the hillbillies live in taverns. The, theirs is the tavern world. And one will come in, and he'll sit down there belligerently for a while, and then he'll go wandering off. And one night, I'm looking out of the window, and I see, I see a parking lot down there, and they're stripping a car. They're stripping a car right under the light. So I called up the police. I said, hey, they're, they're, they're stripping a car right down here next to the White Castle. And the cop says, mind your own business. Mind your own business. He could tell I was an outlander. Now, speaking of outlanders, this is Harold Monolith. We'll be back in 15 minutes. This is WOR Radio, your station for news. Yes, friends, it's time now for Chuck Acre and his Colorado cow hands. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing I remember clearly and distinctly. I remember walking along on a Saturday night, walking through the streets of an Indiana town and hearing hearing the sound coming from every front porch, from every, every kitchen, and from every living room, the sound of a WLS barn dance. You walk along those streets, and you'd hear nothing but the sound of those mosquitoes. You'd hear the sound of those mosquitoes and Montana Slim. Or you'd hear the sound of, of Gene Autry or, or Lula Bell and Scott. You'd hear the sound. <laughs> and you'd walk along there. And then, then, then you'd hear somebody say, It's time now for, what was the name? I'll award the brass figurey with bronze oak leaf palm to anyone who can, who can give me the name of the guy who used to have the little five water. You remember him? He used to do the radio show. Had a little five water. And what was the name of the town, the mythical town, that his little five-watt radio station broadcasted from? And this was all part of WLS Barn Dance. And I would hear that plucking and that a-singing. I would hear that shouting and that carrying on. And uh, <laughs> this is all this is all part of it. it there, there is there is in in the air in our in our land. There is in the air in our land. Here in America, there is something that is wild. There is something that is free. There is something also that is so fugitive, uh, so furtive, and at the same time, so blatantly, so blatantly, uh, well, the word is, it goes even more than wild. But writers who feel this, who sense this, who know this in the air, different to the extremes of panegyric, they're driven to the extremes of, of, of creative limits, 
trying to put it down on paper or to put it into words, trying to say it. I've been trying to say it now so long that I that I don't I don't know where the next word is coming from. I know writers Nelson Aldrin has been trying to say it. Thomas Wolfe tried to say it, and the most the most interesting man to come along in a long time to try to say that, to try to talk about this something that is wild in the country is Tennessee Williams. Williams touches from diamond. Oh yes, don't don't you know it's a funny thing about Williams. Uh, Williams does from time to time touch on this wildness, and I'm not talking about the decadence. I'm not talking about the the perversity. I'm talking about that strange, wild, fugitive sound that that. That, that, that incessant rain that beats in the soul of some people, uh, the, the rain that just constantly rattles down on the, on the corrugated roofs of our lives, that tells us to go, man, go, go and go. I remember walking over a field one time, a cantaloupe field. In Indiana, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing as wonderful as a sun-ripened muskmelon or mushmelon or cantaloupe depending on one part of the state you come from, is the way you pronounce it. Muskmelon, mushmelon, or cantaloupe. And I remember walking over a cantaloupe field one day with that hot sun coming down on those cantaloupe vines crawling along that, that gray-brown soil. And about a block and a half away, you could see the flat, long row of weeping willow trees where the river was quietly drying up. You can smell that soil, you can smell those cantaloupes, and you can feel that wild thing that makes people run, that makes the Sherwood Andersons run out into the world and try to say it in Winesburg, Ohio. But it's all its all part of it, and, and there is also, the, the, as coupled with that, the wildness of a kind of, of, a, of a religious fear, a sort of... Uh, a sort of knowledge that that great sky is about to fall down on everybody. I remember one time watching a farmhouse burn down. I'll never forget this. Uh, it was in southern Michigan, and I had been fishing in a little lake with my brother. And it was a long, hot summer day. And looking up on that hillside, we saw a, a pinpoint of light, and we knew it was a fire. We could see a flicker. And so we beached the boat and ran up the side of the hill among all the cows, and you could begin to smell the smoke as you got about halfway up the hill. And the sun was beating down. It was 120 degrees, that long, hot, humming summer sound of, of southern Michigan and northern Indiana. You know, the, 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 the summers, you know it's summertime in Indiana when it begins to hum. The air actually hums. You can hear the cicadas beginning to scream out that and that long, long humming sound of just the air itself rising and falling and pushing over that hot, parched ground. And we ran up the side of the hill and the farmhouse burnt right down to the very ground and the people just stood around, maybe 25 people, and the farmers tried to pour water on it. Nothing could, nothing could save it. And we walked back and got in the boat and went out and began to fish again for sunfish. And there is that thing wild that says, look out, any minute now. And the hillbillies going from bar to bar, and the sound of those eternal guitars on those twangy noses. And you know, you begin to know then that there is much that is not re- much. And, and one of the great, one of the great quests of the, of the, uh, let's say the disinherited, and these are the hillbillies who neither, who neither work the soil, nor spin their toil, but sort of just float. Uh, they're, they're flotsam and jetsam in that great bowl of the Midwest. They just float on the surface from city to city, and they work at job, and then they then they leave job, and then they move to the next town and work there. They're a kind of modern-day gypsy. You know, did you know that the Midwestern cities are having their immigration problems? Are you aware of that? We have our great minority problems here, people coming up from Puerto Rico and so on. Well, they have their great minority problem. And it's the, it's the great disenchanted, disinherited that float up from Tennessee and Kentucky and drift around on the outskirts of the cities and build their own slums as fast as they can move in. It's a wild, it's a wild thing that, that, that is going on out there. But nevertheless, uh, you, 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 you see these people drifting from bar to bar and the great quest seems to be to discover a new kind of sin. <laughs> 
And, and it really, it really, uh, it's it's a it's a it's a quest of discovery. It's a quest of uh, of uh, of a kind of Sodom and Gomorrah that uh, makes most of the things that Tennessee Williams writes about to anyone who has experienced it seem like not only depra- not depravity at all, but a kind of uh, but a kind of a realistic record of the Bobsy twins. I don't know whether you've wandered along State Street in in uh, Calumet City on a Saturday night, and have dropped into the shows and have watched the faces and have heard the heard the shouts and the cries in the night. You begin to understand that the things that many writers write about are not at all are not at all depravity. And people, so why do they write about them? Well, they write about them because they are there. They write because they are an important part of the lives of many people. I remember one night I used to do a radio show when I was a kid out of a bar. I was doing a, a remote. I was an announcer working. I was in school, actually in high school at the time. And uh, we did a remote out of a bar in Calumet City. It was a lawless town. And uh, I can tell you some stories about that sometime. Radio in a lawless town. Uh, it was really a lawless city, and we were doing a remote out of there, and it was it was a cowboy group. They go great for cowboy music there. Not hillbilly, but cowboy. And uh, doing this remote, we'd set up the equipment about a half an hour before, and all the denizens, the regulars, were sitting along the bar, this long, dark bar. And there was a man working the bar who had been a strong-arm man for the Capone mob. As a matter of fact, most of them in that area at one time or another had been involved in that particular facet of American history, the guys who ran many of the places in this city. They'd been run out of Chicago, and and uh, Calumet City was kind of a, a city all by itself. It was kind of like a free port. <laughs> it, yeah, it was. It really was. It had no connection with Illinois or any other known state. It just sort of existed there. And uh, this, this guy uh, was behind the bar, a, a, a kind of a... Completely taciturn, uh, sort of smoky, drifting creature who never said much to anybody, but obviously was an extremely dangerous man. And about uh, half an hour before the broadcast, somebody walked in and sat down at the end of the bar and just sat. And immediately, I, I sensed it, and the engineer who was with me sensed it, and the cowboy singer sensed that we didn't say anything. We just sat back at the bar amid our equipment, and there was this electric atmosphere. And the bartender, who was also the man who ran the place, who was also one of the great politicians in the town, walked out from behind the bar without saying a word. And he went up behind the man and put his arm around his neck from behind. And he he pushed him by the ribs, took him to the door, picked him up bodily, and threw him out against the fire hydrant, whereupon he promptly broke his neck and immediately died. He walked back into the tavern, and uh, stood behind the bar, made a phone call. Nobody out on the street even even paused. The body was lying across the sidewalk. They just walked right on past. And nobody in the bar said a word. They just continued to drink their beer. He made a phone call, and a couple of men appeared, took, took the uh, victim away, and that was all that was ever said. Ten minutes later, we went on the air, and it was as if nothing had happened. But it had, and I remembered it cleanly and distinctly. There it is, impressed right on my memory. And and uh, you, you live, you, you see these things and you are part of these things for a certain period of time and you begin to understand that much that we say quietly pussyfoots around the truth of, of uh, the life. That, that Speaking of the truth, we have with us today uh, the paper book gallery. And uh, I uh, don't like to suddenly deviate from what we're doing here, but it really isn't in a sense because the other day I was down in uh, the gallery and I picked up a, uh, a volume of short stories by Nelson Aldrin, and I would highly recommend this to you. I don't care where you buy them, but you get another flavor of this of this world, of this land we live in, which is a wildly wonderful land. I've been I've been in many other countries, and I have never once detected. That same frontier wildness that we have is a strong and a, and a flowing thing in America. It is an undiminished thing, that movement from bar to bar. Have you ever heard the expression that the hillbillies use? You want to go juking? 
I saw this uh, pop up in a movie the other night. Funny, the person who was with me said, what do you mean by jukin? You know what jukin is? A jukin is a, is a hillbilly term. It is a Saturday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night. I got nothing to do, and so let's go out jukin term. And they move from bar to bar, and they throw a couple of quarters in the jukebox of every bar. And they don't dance, you know. This is the impression that people like to give you, that they go to just listen to the music. No. They go jukin, drinking beer, and looking for trouble. And the thing that they're really looking for is trouble. Because trouble is a sport. Trouble is a sport, and it's a... Uh, it's really a competitive sport. And it's not a good night unless there's some some flashing blades in the dark. It's not a good night. Well, anyway, we have with us the paper book gallery, and I would like to recommend, if you drop down there tonight, to pick up a, a volume of Nelson Algren's Neon Wilderness. He talks about the, the sad Milwaukee Avenue moon of home, which is that... That sad moon that shines down on Republic Steel, on the long, tired, moiling south sides of everywhere. And this is Nelson Ogren's Neon Wilderness. And we're talking about the paper book gallery. There are two paper book galleries. And I don't know of a more pleasant place in New York just to quietly spend an hour or two than the gallery down on Sheridan Square. And if you're, if you're looking for a place to... To uh, just spend a couple of hours, just just uh, just to feel New York the way New York really is, or at least one element of it, I would suggest either one of the two paper book galleries. I get calls from people from all over the country who come in and say, "I heard about it on your show, and by George, it's the greatest thing I've seen yet in town." Uh, the paper book gallery, the the one that I like particularly, is on Sheridan Square, and it's over on the east side of the square. Uh, excuse me, the west side. It's on the west side. I'm, I'm never good on directions. It's on the west side where 10th Street comes into 7th Avenue South, and it's called the Paper Book Gallery. And you'll see a great big flashing sign up high up in the sky there at night. And they're open until 2 o'clock this morning, the Paper Book Gallery on Sheridan Square, and there's one over on 3rd Street. And if you drop in tonight, just look the guy in the eye and just say Excelsior, and he knows you're a friend. Speak to your friends. This is W-O-R-A-M at FM, New York. And we have with us, uh, right next to the gallery, by the way, if you'd like to spend a, uh, a, an hour or two enjoying a meal, the, the likes of which you will seldom see in New York, we would like to recommend yin and yang. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a difficult thing for people. It's an interesting thing, too, that in this city, uh, a great city, which I think New York is, it's an unparalleled city in the world, that it is often very difficult to find a good place to eat in. And this is so surprising to me. And yet we have uh, probably the greatest panoply of restaurants in the world. I can say this, though. Unfortunately, I think that, that, uh, that the food in the average American city ranges from superb to absolutely abysmal. And you can never tell by the prices. You just can't tell by the prices. Yeah, I've gone into restaurants where I paid really, uh, really high prices for meals and have come away absolutely completely dissatisfied. Matter of fact, I would enjoy a, a good, honest, needy hot dog more than I would some of the expensive restaurants in town as food, and as an honest, as an uh, honest expression of a certain kind of food. And if you're looking for a really good Oriental restaurant, I would suggest Ying and Yang. They have a nice bar. But the food is superb, the, the whole atmosphere is good, and they're open until 1 o'clock in the morning, and they're on, on 3rd Street, 82 West 3rd Street, and they're open Sundays. If you're coming into town, and you, I, 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 I find New York extremely exciting in the middle of, in the middle of summer. I, I, I hate to leave New York even for a day because there is some of that wildness is in this town during during the summertime. No other time do I really feel it except maybe late Friday nights in January. But uh, Yin and Yang is over on 3rd Street, 82 West 3rd, and they're open from noon Sunday to about 1 o'clock in the morning. So if you're looking for a Sunday dinner place, this is it. A superb uh, Chinese uh, Chinese cuisine. And incidentally, uh, one of the great gourmet magazines recently pointed them out as being one of the five outstanding Chinese restaurants in the United States. A, a magnificent restaurant. The prices are very moderate. And I, I personally, if you, if you drop in 
you really want something that, that you've never had before, I would personally recommend that you ask for their chicken wing appetizers. This is a magnificent dish. It is not it is not at all. You know, when I eat a chicken wing, when Bill Chan said to me, try our chicken wings, Bill is the, is the operator of the place. He said, try chicken wings. Go ahead, try it. <laughs> chicken wings. I immediately had the feeling that I was back in the Army. I was getting either chicken wings or cold cuts. I will award the brass fig degree with bronze oak leaf palm for any ex-GI who can, <laughs> who can, who can give me... <laughs> no, I better not. I mean, there are laws about that. What, what, what... Uh, just, just look this chick in the eye that you're with and smile at her and tell her you know what the Army appellation for cold cuts is. Another word. <laughs> she said, what is he talking about? What, what, what is it now, Charlie? Tell me what it is. <laughs> I didn't say it. You said it, and it was, it was part of the Army. But when he said chicken wings, I had that feeling. Oh. And anyway, when it arrived, I, I, uh, I'm a real addict now. And in fact, many times I go down to yin and yang, and all I have are chicken wings. I have chicken wings and, and a little tea and some rice, and I'm ready. Uh, this is Yin and Yang, 82 West 3rd Street, and I would like to recommend that you call before you go. That you call before you go because uh, you're liable to find that they're all filled up. There are only 18 tables in the place. 82 West 3rd Street. <laughs> you know, speaking of uh, experimenting with sin and, and the, the whole panoply of Midwestern world, uh, it's a, uh, it's an interesting thing uh, to 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 know, really to know, uh, to to have lived through, to have been, and we all have passed. You know, it's funny. I get all kinds of letters from people who say, you know, gee whiz, wow, we all have lived. There's this long tape recorder that that is this thing of life, and there behind us, each one of us is this long reel of tape. And it's got stuff all over it. It's got stuff all over it, and it, it just merely remains for the editor to come along and look at it to make some sense out of it. That's all. To make some sense and to make some focus come into come into being. Like one time, I'm I'm uh, sitting on a bench. I'm sitting on a park bench in Bug House Square. Do you know Bug House Square in Chicago? Well, Bug House Square in Chicago is the uh, is something. Oh, sure, you know about Bug House Square. It's it's famous. Well, Bughouse Square is where all the is where all the the orators, the sidewalk orators, congregate to orate. And uh, Bughouse Square is a is a real institution in Chicago. I think the only parallel that we have here in New York uh, is the rapidly dying institution of union. But Bughouse Square did not relate only to social conditions. To anybody who had something bugging him. Anybody who was bugged by something, and that's where the term, of course, bug house is a Midwestern term for bug house. And bug house square was where the guys would get up on their soapbox, and each guy would wait his turn. And he would stand, I, I remember one guy used to come to bug house square, and I would, I would sit on the park bench and I would watch him work. He was a, he was a majestic figure to work, uh, to watch work. And this guy was a guy who was bugged on health foods. And he was kind of an early Dr. Carlton Fredericks, only unsponsored, and and with no no knowledge whatsoever. But he was bugged, and he would get up on that soapbox, and he had ragged clothes, and he had a look in the eye, and he would stand up there, and he would he would he would level down at the at his listeners. He'd say, "Now look here, you guys, I'm not going to be here today talking to you about the Red Menace." I'm not going to talk to you about. I'm not going to talk to you about our English brothers across the sea. This is just the way he talked. He had a beautiful flower expression. I'm going to talk to you about what's happening to your lower coat. I'm going to talk to you about sin and chopped cabbage. And he would go on and on and on. Somehow he paralleled the rise of sin, the rise of Al Capone, the rise of Machine Gun Kelly, the rise of, of Pretty Boy Floyd, with the lack of roughage in the diet of the average Midwesterner. And he would go on and on and on for about a half an hour, and then when he would finish, it was such a feat of virtuosity that the crowd would roar with a great applause, and he would step down, and then the next guy would step up, who was a socialist. And he would talk about government-owned telephone companies. <laughs> and and this uh, tradition, I guess, still remains. Uh, it, it's still part of the 
of the world of Chicago. And in fact, uh, I've I've noticed that uh, more and more people are beginning to be aware of the interesting uh, development of a kind of renaissance that is coming out of Chicago in the last couple of years. People like Shelley Berman and Mike and Elaine and the Compass Theater and all this is kind of springing out. And, and the, th- the satirical theater has become a really going institution in that city. Uh, and the theater is finally performing the function that it originally set out to do. And that is to bring into focus the world in which we live and to comment on it rather than to merely entertain, which uh, seems to be what the chief function of the theater is in the New York area. But uh, I can remember that, that rising, that rising late, late, late summer evening world of Bug House Square and all the rest of the shouts and the hollerings that went up and down North Clark Street. <laughs> it's all part of it. It reminds me of this. Somebody sent this little thing to me a couple of nights ago on the Sunday night show. Uh, speaking of the hillbillies, constant quest for a new sin. Of course, he isn't alone in that. I got a somebody sent me a note about a preacher who who had uh, been asked uh, out in the Midwest. Of course, this is the the the, the thing that uh, Mencken used to call. This is the area that he used to refer to as the Bible Belt. And uh, somebody was interviewing a an evangelist about sin, and, and the evangelist said, there are 785 sins, and all men are sinners. There are 785 sins in each one of them. And, of course, this is a very intriguing thing, that the man had finally had finally pinpointed it, that there were 785 sins. Well, I, as soon as I heard about this, I sat down and I started to count over the sins that I knew, that I, that I, I really knew about. And I, I, I could figure out about nine uh, really, and, and then I began to realize how much I had missed in this world, you know. And, and uh, so this uh, article went on to say that, that the minister was besieged, this, this uh, evangelist was besieged with mail from people uh, asking him for a list of the, of the sin. Uh-huh. What, what, are the, what are these 785 sins? And most of them came from guys who figured they'd been missing out on something. <laughs> well, not more than about three days later, I don't know whether you're aware of the guy who draws Little Orphan Annie. Now, he, he is a two-headed monster. On, uh, on the one side, he is probably the most out-and-out blatant uh, propagandist in America who works in the comic strip medium, which is a very effective medium, by the way. I'll never forget how, how the Asp used to settle all problems. He merely beheaded his opponents. And how... Uh, how old Daddy Warbucks would arrive on the scene and, and the, the villains or the miscreants never had a fair trial. Uh, they, they merely would crawl on the Asp and Punjab, and Punjab would throw a cape over them, make them disappear, and Asp would behead them as they were in the process of disappearing. And that settled all sin. And, of course, this, uh, this came, uh, came into full flower during the McCarthy period when, uh, <laughs> when this particular side of the American sense of of justice began to override all other reasonable men's small outcries down in the bushes, and of course this is this is a thing that that uh, Little Orphan Annie has advocated for a long time. Well, down underneath the uh, Little Orphan Annie thing uh, is a little strip where obviously his sneaky side comes out. He also draws that. It's called Maw Green, and here it shows Maw. I'll read this to you. A couple of weeks ago, it shows Maw standing there, and she's got an amused look on her face. And you see, behind her is a guy who's got his hat pushed back of his head and his hair. Is, and by the way, he has a bow tie. Everybody instinctively mistrusts a man who wears a bow tie. Remember that. And he's wearing a blue bow tie, which is the sneakiest kind of blow tie, a bow tie. Blue ones are worse than any other color. So he's wearing a blue bow tie and a hat pushed back on his head, and he's talking to the mailman. And this, this sneaky-looking character says, You sure you got nothing for me? And the mailman, who looks like Will Rogers, says, Nope, nothing today. And Ma says to him, You expecting an important letter? And now the sneaky guy looks at Ma and he says, I'll say I am. I heard that preacher feller on the radio say that there's 742 different sins. I wrote him for the list. And Ma says, Why? And now he's tipping his hat over his eye and walking away, and he says, Well, only seems reasonable. I'd like to know if I've been missing something. <laughs> this in the comic strips. <laughs> he did another one, too, a couple of months ago that I'll never forget. Shows Ma, uh, little kids uh, saying, 
asking Ma about something, and Ma says, well, I'll tell you, a bachelor is a guy who comes, goes to work from a different direction every morning. <laughs> You'll have to run back and feel that one against the vines. It's all part of the same thing. And, and it's interesting to note that not one person remembers the name of the guy who, who broadcast on the Little Five Water. And while on the subject of the Little Five Water, we have with us Lufthansa Airlines. And uh, speaking of Chicago, I see that Lufthansa has just in their new overseas service that flies directly from Chicago to Paris, which is somehow grotesque. I mean, it just doesn't seem right. And I understand that boats are coming right into the Great Lakes now. They're, they're, they're sailing right into the Great Lakes and, and right up that old St. Lawrence River, right down the Straits of Mackinac and right right over to Cleveland, right down to Chicago, flying the Dutch flag. And it just doesn't seem right. But uh, nevertheless, if you're planning to fly the coop, we would like to recommend that you, you consider Lufthansa, which has become more and more the really preferred airlines among most European travelers. And for very good reasons, uh, everything is done right on Lufthansa. And, and believe me, I'm not going to sit here and talk to you about taking an overseas trip merely because of the kind of food that's served on an airplane. This is ridiculous. But I can say this, that you will, you will never experience a trip uh, the, the likes of the type and the kind that you will experience on any class, tourist, any class of Lufthansa flight. I mean, they do it right all the way down the line, everything. Matter of fact, uh, I am uh, I was sitting in the plane, a little incident that happened, and after we had finished dinner on the Lufthansa plane, which is a magnificent thing that goes on for at least 4,000 miles at that rate of, a, of speed that a 707 flies, you're high up. Did I tell you about the two French fighters saluting the Lufthansa plane when I was in the plane? Yeah, we were flying about 36, 37,000 feet uh, high out over the French coast, uh, coming back from uh, from Frankfurt on the Lufthansa plane, when suddenly I saw a couple of uh, little glints off over the starboard wing. And sure enough, uh, I closer and closer they came, and, and suddenly both of them uh, began to appear really as, as objects, and I saw that they were a pair of French vampire jets, and both of them uh, saluted the plane. They made a big chandelle, and they, they saluted this big 707 because it was the first... German 707 uh, transcontinental transoceanic jet flight, and they were kind of giving us a, a French salute, and, sh- <laughs> and they they peeled off from sight. But just about that time, after dinner was over, the steward wheeled out a barrel of uh, German beer, very light, very wonderfully light, delicious Hanoverian beer, and uh, they began to serve this beer out of an actual keg. It was not served out of bottles or anything. And, and I asked him, I says, how do you how do you keep the pressure up at this atmosphere? And he said, you know, it took him a year and a half to design a moving airborne uh, <laughs> supersonic keg. It's a very difficult thing to keep the, the pressure in a beer keg. Of course, the plane's pressure, the, they have pressurized cabins, but the pressure varies as you go from one altitude to the next. And this beer keg is a real triumph of German ingenuity. But it's an example of the kind of attention to detail. So if you're planning an overseas flight, you really should investigate Lufthansa. Everything is done right. That's Lufthansa. You sure? I mean, are you sure? <laughs> and and uh, it's, a, it's a world of its own, you know. Speaking of uh, the world of its own, I, I, uh, I'm not so sure whether or not the... Uh, of course, our own ideal of of reality is, is strictly our own. I remember one time speaking of the Midwest. I remember this about the Midwest: that uh, that everyone there was a, there was a remark made in a magazine recently about the theater, uh, why Chicago doesn't have a good theater. Well, I've had a theory about it for a long time, and my theory is roughly this: that here in the East. Uh, when a person goes to the theater, he goes, first of all, to the theater. This is a big capital letter thing. He goes to the theater. And it is a, it is a whole preparation before he goes in. He is prepared for the theater. He is a true believer when he walks through those doorways. Uh, he is, he is experiencing something which has been part of his long time. And as 
this being the case, since he is a believer and it's part of his life, he loses a large portion of his critical powers. As a matter of fact, George Ade, who wrote uh, many Broadway hits, once remarked on that. He says, you know, he says, <laughs> he says, I, I lose, he says, I, I lose a lot of my critical powers when I walk into a theater. Well, uh, this is not true of many Midwesterners who are not part of that mystique of the theater. They go to see the play because going to the theater is not as mystical a thing. It is not so completely interwoven into his life. So when he goes, he merely looks at what he sees. And if he doesn't like what he sees, he walks out. He doesn't like it. Whereas the, the New Yorker will, will concentrate on watching Geraldine Page. Uh, he knows about Geraldine Page. He's been part of the Brooks Atkinson world. And so it's all much more wonderful than it really is. It's a kind of magic which is not not surrounding this art object when it arrives out in the Midwest. It's, it's shorn of all of it. And the point that was made by this magazine writer regarding Chicago and the Midwest was that these people are not really, uh, they're not really taken in by professionalism and by gloss, by polish and by production. They are much more involved in something that goes beyond that. And I, and I have to admit that there is some truth to this, that, that there is some truth to this. And I, uh, I don't know where it comes from, but I do know that it is there. I remember my mother coming to New York, and uh, she decided she was going to see a couple of dramatic shows. And uh, she went to see two of them, one of which uh, I, I, I will not use the names because I don't want to hurt anybody's production or play works. Anyway, she went to see, she went to see the play, and, and after she came back, I was already caught up in New Yorkism. Yeah, I was already involved in production. I already was impressed by sets, and I was impressed by, by lighting and all this stuff. But my mother was there watching the story and watching the people. And I said to her, how'd you like it, Ma? I mean, this is, you know, this is Broadway theater. And she sat for a while. She says, well, I don't know. I guess it was me. I said, what do you mean, Ma? She said, well, I guess it was me. I, I don't know. It seemed kind of silly. I mean, those people talk awful loud, and they say silly things, and they do silly things. I said, well, what do you mean silly things? She says, well, I mean, you know... She should have just called the, the hospital right there the first five minutes when he said he was a dope addict like that, and, and it would have been all over. I said, but, Ma, that isn't... <laughs> so you couldn't get through. I mean, you just it was impossible to, to, make, the, uh, to make the breakthrough. And I remember uh, maybe, maybe there is a reason for this. I used to play golf when I was a caddy. Being a kid, I caddied on a, on a city golf course and also on a private club course when Saturday afternoons would come around and I could get a quarter around, which is what they paid in those days. And I used to caddy, and on, on days when there were too many caddies, which often happened, and not enough golfers, because at the time the Midwest was not steeped in golfism, uh, there would be maybe 25 caddies and four golfers playing, uh, and believe it or not, as incredible as it sounds, uh, we would wander around the golf course and look for lost balls. Just wander around on those hot summer, long summer afternoons. Just kind of wander around and wander around. And one of the things that we used to do would be at the ninth hole, which was a water hazard hole, we would sit down and fish for bullheads. Have you ever fished in the middle of a golf course? And we would sit there and fish for bullheads. And I remember one, one long, hot summer Saturday afternoon, I'm sitting on the mud bank fishing for bullheads right in the middle of the golf course, and a ball whistled overhead <laughs> on its way to the ninth green. And uh, the man came along. He's carrying his golf clubs. He's got a, a four-piece set of Sears Roebuck specially matched wood irons. He's walking along there with the, with the golf clubs rattling in the bag. And uh, he comes along the edge of the bank, looks down at me, and he says, You see my ball go over here? I says, Yep, went over that way towards the ninth green. And uh, he stood there for a while. I'm sitting down there on the bank. He says, Are they biting? I said, Pretty good, yeah. And I had a string of catfish. I had about maybe seven or eight catfish. And I held up the string, and he's, he, he looks down towards the ninth green. He says, Kind of hot for golf. I said, That was a nice shot. Yep, it's kind of hot, though. 
And so he proceeded to go in the direction of his ball. And he disappeared over the bunker. He was gone. I figured he was going on with his golf game. What he was doing, actually, was he was just going after his ball. He had decided to give up golf for the day. And ten minutes later, he, he comes back over the bunker. He's got his ball in the bag, and he's got the, the clubs all stuck. He says, you mind if I fish a while? I said, no. And he reaches down into his golf bag, and he had one of these folding telescopic steel rods, which he pulls out, complete with all the rest of the equipment. Sits down, and he says, you got any dough balls? I said, yep. And I sat there and fished with a golfer for the rest of the afternoon for for bullheads. And every 15 or 20 minutes, a ball would go whistling overhead. And after you've lived in this in this milieu for a while, you realize that people are out there, out there in the darkness, and they're digging around under the rocks, sniffing around down at the base of the privet hedge, and they're all looking for a new kind of sin in one way or another. It's like this letter this kid wrote to me. And, and I, I think I should have... I think I should have uh, uh, some some American type music to play behind this. Ah, that's American music. Great waves of strings about to play something, but never quite getting to the point. Shepherd, I'm living in Forest Hills, and I've got this father who comes home every week with a copy of Life magazine under his arm. And who every night at 7 o'clock after supper sits down in front of the television set and falls asleep by the middle of the third show, stretches himself, says, I guess I'll hit the sack, and disappears in the direction of his bedroom. My mother does approximately the same thing, only longer. She stays up through the 11.15 news. And I don't know what I do, actually. I wish I knew. I, 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 I don't look at television much. I listen to you once in a while on the radio. And I don't know many guys who like to knock out fly balls. But then again, you send forest hills. And the other day, I, I see this big sign. It's an advertisement for a, for a big department store. And the big sign says, we're having a giant sale to celebrate the wonderful way we live. And, and I'm wondering, Shepard, whether they're talking about my old man, who it seems to me died maybe five years ago he just hasn't stopped moving and my mother is on her way and I and I'm beginning to suspect that I'm going the same way and so I look at that great big sign I nod curtly and I continue on my way back home after school Shepard what do you, what what do you say about this I don't know, son. <laughs> I don't know what to say about it. This is a letter from a kid. A 15-year-old kid. Why he writes me, I don't know. And so as you look out over that long, long line of waving hills, you understand. Speaking of waving hills, we have with us another one of our people, Ripple. Now, I don't know if you've tried Ripple or not, but I, I will say this, that once you have tried Ripple, you will never forget it. It is absolutely a completely unique wine. It is different from any wine I have ever tasted. And I have tasted wines in the Moselle Valley. I have tasted wines in the Argentia. I have tasted wines in the, in the, in the lesser-known provinces of Belgium. But this wine stands completely unique. It is different from all... And by the way, it comes in a little bottle. It's a little bottle about the size of a soft drink bottle. And it runs only 33 cents per each. And you can get it in red or white, and it should be served ice cold, absolutely ice cold. And it's made by Gallo Wine in Modesto, California. And it uh, it has a... It has a it's, it's got a real place. And I would suggest you try it. It's a Ripple by Gallo. And 
he goes on, you see. He goes on trying to pluck that loot string. Oh, yes. Oh, oh, but, but, but then we can't, we can't forget. We can't forget that glow against the sky. That, that growing glow against the sky that every Midwestern kid in northern Indiana knows and it's emblazoned in his soul. You come out there on a quiet winter's night and you stand in the backyard next to the garage and you see the blast furnace and the open hearth flickering up there against the sky. And you know that somehow man's destiny is there written in the clouds, written in those scudding long lines of smoke that go echoing out over the lake. And speaking of the lake, I remember swimming in Lake Michigan, completely, completely covered up and up to my hocks in, in the, well, whatever it is that the, that the Lever, the Lever Brothers plant throws out over that lake. Yes, it's been done. A great, great coating of palm olive soap. And a great coating of chipso flakes. And you swim in that old lake amid the oil and the steel and the rising smoke screen of a Midwestern world. And you say, by George, I can see it happening. I can see it happening. But then again, on second thought, when you get out there and you begin to dry off and you're smelling like that, like that oily water that you just came out of, you don't, you don't really know whether you are seeing it or not. And just kind of sit and wait for it to happen. Whatever it is. I mean, we're all waiting, you know. Uh, I'm not quite sure who we're waiting for. Uh, but we're maybe... But this is this is Moon Mullins here, friends. We'll be back again tomorrow night with the pool room hour. Immediately after the 9 o'clock station break. Of this, your friendly station. This is WOR Radio, your station for news.